Rob Vernier. Today we're looking at regulation and the theories of Sonia Livingston and Peter Lunt. So Livingston and Lunt, I've got two main ideas we're going to be looking at here. There's the idea that there's an underlying struggle in recent UK regulation policy between the need to further the interests of citizens by offering protection from harmful or offensive material and the need to further the interests of consumers by ensuring choice, value for money and market competition. There's also the fact that the increasing power of global media corporations, together with the rise of convergent media technologies and transformations in the production, distribution and marketing of digital media, have placed traditional approaches to media regulation at risk. So let's look at the first one of these. The idea that there's an underlying struggle in recent UK regulation policy between the need to further the interests of citizens by offering protection from harmful or offensive material and the need to further the interests of consumers by ensuring choice, value for money and market competition. Okay, let's consider reception theory and censorship. If the reception theories of people like Harold Laswell, Paul Lazarfeld and Liu Katz Albert Bandura, the cultivation theory of George Gerbiner and Larry Gross are true, then it follows that exposure to media has a profound influence on our behaviour. The hypodermic needle theory, the two-step flow model, the media effects theory all suggest that we're affected by the media we see. Now if that's true, that it can be argued therefore that society needs to be protected from the harmful effect, uh, potentially harmful effects of the media. In particular, those who are considered vulnerable, especially children, should be protected from exposure to harmful materials. That's why, for example, we have a watershed on TV that says that you're not allowed to show anything like sex or nudity, swearing or violence before 9 o'clock at night to protect children. So what kind of things are we talking about? What kind of stuff can be considered harmful? Well, the British Board of Film Classification, whose job it is to rate uh, films, videos, uh, you know, home video, DVDs, Blu-rays, etc., video on demand, and um, they used to do video games as well, although that's now been taken over by Peggy. I think they still do video games, actually, but anyway. What kind of things have they got listed as things to be taken into account? Well, they particularly have to look for discriminatory language, such as religion, race, gender, sexuality, or those against mental and physical disabilities. Adult themes and situations that might be considered too distressing for younger and more sensitive viewers. The use of offensive language, profanity, the use of racial and ethnic slurs. Nudity sexual content including scenes of sexual activity and spoken visual references to sex between humans doesn't matter for animals to a certain extent violence gore and injury detail sexual violence including rape and the forced disrobing especially dangerous actions that can easily be imitated by younger or more naive viewers certain combat moves like ear clappings headbutts neck breaking in particular all visual and verbal references to suicide, particularly if it involves hanging oneself or slashing one's wrists. Detailed criminal acts like breaking into a house using a credit card to jimmy the lock or hot wiring a car. Both of which are actually impossible, but hey, whatever. Actions that result in injuries or death in real life, but are almost always shown in the media, especially on shows aimed at children's audience like cartoons, with no negative consequences, such as hiding in appliances that can trap or kill small children, like tumble dryers and old refrigerators ingesting or misusing common household chemicals or creating dangerous devices from common household items like a flamethrower from an aerosol can and a cigarette lighter all fall into that category. Scenes of horror, threat and danger and their intensity on audience members and drug abuse being condoned or glamorised. Um, there's some interesting examples here um, that have been cropping up. Um, anyone who's been watching the new um, series of Star Trek on Netflix would have noticed a particularly notable use of strong swearing in an episode last week that's proved to be extremely controversial uh, based on the fact that there are those that consider Star Trek to be a family show 
Um, there's things like um, the certain combat moves. I mean, notably, famously in this country, um, when it was originally released, um, the scenes from Enter the Dragon, where Bruce Lee used nunchucks, were censored in this country. They were edited out. Indeed, any kind of movie where nunchucks were used was edited because it was considered to be um, a weapon that could easily be made using DIY skills and they didn't want people hurting themselves. We've got things like um, The Evil Dead, for example, was heavily censored when that first came out. It was one of the original video nasties. In particular, the sequence in that when uh, a, a woman is stabbed in the ankle with a pencil and there's a prolonged sequence where this pencil is ground into her ankle. That was considered a piece of violence that could easily be imitated. Um, interestingly, um, I read somewhere that uh, originally the time machine in Back to the Future was going to be a refrigerator, not a DeLorean. Because, uh, but they changed their mind because they were afraid that children would be, you know, getting trapped in fridges. Children have easy access to fridges, but they don't have easy access to the DeLoreans. So there's some examples of things that have been censored. There was a years ago, early 21st century. There was a famous Tango advert, where it was a you being tangled out thing, where a giant like a a, a uh, an, an obese orange painted man in a nappy in the adverts would run up and slap a person on both cheeks as they drunk a can of tango um, that became a playground craze and the adverts were banned after a number of incidents where children had their eardrums ruptured by people tangoing them so imitatable violence is something that's very much um, frowned upon Obviously, different countries have very different attitudes towards classification and censorship. Um, America, for example, tends to be extremely uh, tough on sex and nudity, but very lax on violence. Things that would be 18 certificate cinema in, in the cinemas over here would be R-rated over America, which means anyone can watch it as long as they're accompanied by somebody over the age of 16. Um, in this country, we tend to be more lax when it comes to sex and nudity but much tougher when it comes to violence especially depictions of sexual violence um, other countries like france for example are much more liberal than us um, there are examples of films that were 18 certificates in this country there were 12 certificates in france and in france the classification boards are not allowed to censor anything they're not allowed to cut films at all unlike the bbfc in this country to be fair the BBFC don't censor things in this country. They just say, um, you know, you will not get an 18 certificate if it's got this bit in it. Or if you want a 15 certificate, you can't get it if it's got these bits in it. Interestingly, there are fewer and fewer 18 certificate films nowadays because A, the BBFC are getting more liberal. And B, um, filmmakers don't want 18 certificates because it limits their audience. So they're not actually submitting stuff that would have any significant material in it. So there is an element of classification and censorship that can be very controversial. There are, of course, various legal acts that um, the media producers are expected to abide by, including the Video Recordings Act of 1984, which is where we got the famous Video Nasties bill from, in which a number of films were banned. Back in those days, films and cinemas had to be classified, but those for home video didn't. It's different now, of course. But that meant that a lot of stuff that was would have been clearly unsuitable even for cinema release was getting released uncut in this country. Films like I Spit in Your Grave and um, Cannibal Holocaust and that kind of stuff were you know, uncensored on video. There was a massive moral panic about this. Remember Moral Panics and Folk Devils, Stanley Cohen? And a bunch of films got banned including The Evil Dead, for example. All of these films are now available pretty much uncut in this country. Um, there's still some that are still edited, but we've got much more lax about those kind of things. Um, if you look at something like The Evil Dead today, 
it looks laughably tame compared with the average episode of The Walking Dead, which is shown uncut on primetime television. There's also the Obscene Publications Act. <clears throat> this does, deals with obscenity. Um, and it can also deal with things like blasphemy. It's very rare, but every now and then a film or television show can be banned for blasphemy. Um, the most famous example of this, of course, being Monty Python's Life of Brian, which was banned by numerous councils um, back in the 1980s, including the council where I grew up, Romello. They banned it. And Swansea Council banned it, which is ironic, since the woman who played Judith is now their mayor. There are also various government bodies and organisations that are dealing with media complaints and the classification of media products. There's things like the Independent Press Standards Organisation, or IPSO, and the Office of Communication, Ofcom, which deal with the regulation of the press and the um, you know, TV and internet stuff. We've got the BBFC, which deal with the classification of films and video games and television. And we've got PEGI, which is the Pan-European Game Information classification system which classifies video games in class we will be doing some research into the classification and censorship of films and video games now there is a big debate and argument about this kind of stuff in society um, for example in particular about the debate between classification and censorship um, who controls what we're allowed to access and what are the motivations behind that control who has a right to decide what we can and cannot read or see or hear? And what right does the government, for example, have to monitor our media and our internet consumption and our communications? Where is our freedom of speech in all of this? Some people, um, you know, the BBFC used to be the British Board of Film Class uh, Censorship. But you know, they would ban films like um, Battleship Temkin, for example, was banned for many years because it was seen to promote communism. And they didn't want people being able to see communist propaganda. Um, now those days, the, the, the British Board of Film Classification, however, they say that they are there to publish guidelines to help the public make an informed choice about what they want to consume. You know, they've got... A very good website which has got detailed information on it about why films have received certain classifications uh, also a very interesting podcast about you know why things get classified certain ways and um, about why certain famous examples of films got banned or cut so there's a liberal argument that states that all censorship is wrong that adults should have access to whatever material they wish as long as it doesn't violate the rights of others or break any laws, for example. Um, this idea that classification uh, is patronising, that censorship is flat out immoral, and that we should have freedom of expression and artistic freedom and freedom of speech, and that classification and censorship is a violation of these rights. Um, it's also the case, of course, that the classification of video games, films and television in particular have become a lot more liberal and less heavy-handed over the years. There's still a lot of moral panics about things like video games in particular because it's seen that audiences for films and TV, for example, are quite passive, whereas video games by their very nature are interactive. So therefore, in a video game where you are shooting someone, it's like you are actually shooting them. There have been, you know, some very example, famous examples of moral panics upon folk devils about video games in recent years. Uh, most notably, Grand Theft Auto always comes in for a lot of complaint. Um, the other classic example recently was Manhunt back on the old Nintendo Wii, where obviously to cut someone's throat in that video game, you actually had to mimic the actions using the Wii remotes. So that was considered particularly interactive and therefore particularly immoral, and that ended up getting banned. But nonetheless, this stuff that is available on TV nowadays, for example, that would have never even got a cinema release 20 years ago. 
it's very rare for a film to get banned in this country, for example. I mean, the most recent example would be Human Centipede 2. Um, largely because of its depiction of sexual violence, but Human Centipede is regularly shown on TV. There's also a more conservative attitude that presses for a lot more censorship and the suppression or even outright banning of objectionable material. Um, back in the late 70s through to the 1990s, there was very much a vocal um, moral majority opinion. The most famous example of which was Mary Whitehouse and the National Viewers and Listeners Association. They were extremely vocal. Mary Whitehouse was a household name regularly on the news calling for the banning of things that they thought were immoral um, she was a very right wing Christian she was opposed to example uh, the depiction of homosexuality she was very much against that in the 70s but um, you know she was constantly campaigning against sex and violence and swearing on television and in films she banned to get first she you know, campaign to get films banned, things like that. Um, every couple of years there is a moral panic about some film, for example, and how depraved it is. You know, recently we've had films like a Serbian film, um, and Irreversible. Um, and back in the nineties you had films like David Cronenberg's Crash, all of which were either banned or heavily censored. The most recent and pressing example of this and the government controlling what we have access to comes from only a few months ago it's still an ongoing issue as part of their election campaign the conservative government proposed a wide-ranging set of internet regulations to clamp down on internet content in particular they wanted to force internet companies to allow the government access to everybody's private communications to our email to our text messages to our browser histories and all this kind of stuff um, this is being done as a security measure particularly an attempt to crack down on extremist material particularly um, Islamic fundamentalist material right-wing fundamentalist material uh, but also things like um, extreme pornography or any other material that's considered objectionable and that violates UK law this is a very controversial issue there are those who support these measures they say well look this is extremely harmful material the internet is full of some exceptionally nasty stuff and that we need to be protecting people from it especially young children who you know shouldn't be stumbling across this kind of stuff online there are others however who see it as a conservative moralistic illiberal attempt to crack down on access to perfectly legal material uh, one of the regulations the government wanted to do was to um, if people wanted to access pornographic material online they would be forced to enter their credit card details in order to confirm that they're over 18. Now, regardless of your views on the morality of pornography, there's an argument that this is a violation of people's freedoms, the freedom of speech, when you're accessing what material that is perfectly legal. Whether you consider it moral or not is another matter. This might have an effect on UK businesses. Um, it's also a gross violation of free speech and privacy. Um, if the government want to tap your phone, then they have to have the express written permission of the Home Secretary. It's the same with access to our mail, our, our physical post. You know, we have got freedom of speech that, and freedom of, of um, privacy that protects that kind of communication. Um, why is the internet different? What gives the government the right to be able to access our private communications? There's the argument to say that if you have not done anything wrong or immoral, then you've got nothing to worry about this kind of access. But nonetheless, it's a violation of our freedom of privacy and speech. 
there are laws in this country that govern things like hate speech uh, that don't exist, say, in America, where you are, because of their freedom of speech laws, you are allowed to use all sorts of truly offensive language that would get you prosecuted in this country. One of the big factors in this, of course, is the globalisation of the media. We've looked, for example, at how the media start to be dominated by transnational, global, cross-media conglomerates. Well, with the increasing power of global media corporations, um, Google, spring to mind, for example, together with the rise of convergent media technologies and transformation in the production, distribution and marketing of digital media, this has placed traditional approaches to media regulation at risk. So, when you think about what's changed in the last 20 odd years, you of course, as we said, are digital natives. You don't remember a time when there was no such thing as broadband, let alone no such thing as the World Wide Web or the Internet. And in the last 20 years, there's been a radical change in the way that we consume media. And this has been brought about as a result of the computer revolution, the internet and the World Wide Web, especially the Web 2.0, and technological convergence. This is a different kind of convergence to what you were looking at with Disney. That was media convergence. Now, what is media technological convergence? Well, according to Pieter J. Fourry, it's the coming together of information and communication technologies to create new ways of producing, distributing and using knowledge, information and entertainment. This is a phrase that was first coined by David Butler in 1978. Sometimes this will be referred to as the black box theory, which is a Henry Jenkins term, but essentially means it's one device that can supply us with all our ICT and media production, distribution and consumption requirements. Examples. Smart television. Tablet computers like the iPad. Games consoles like the PS4 or the Xbox One. Um, streaming devices like this Google Chromecast or... I don't even call them smart devices like this um, new Amazon View or Amazon Echo and things that are potential future devices like down the bottom right here we've got Google Glass which is a kind of computer heads up display wireless device um, that was hitting the headlines quite strongly a couple of years ago before sort of like petering out but that's gone away completely. But there are those who see it as the future of communication. Actual, you know, things like um, enhanced reality and all that kind of stuff. Think about it. 20 years ago, well, I say 20 years ago, more like 30 or 40 years ago now, if you go back into the 1980s, all of the devices that this guy's holding here, uh, a boombox or ghetto blaster, as it used to be called in those days, rather racistly, um, you know, telephone, or personal stereo, uh, you've got a watchman there, it's a little personal TV, walker, walkman, a couple of walkmen, you've got a dictaphone, video camera, video cassette recorder, there's a Betamax video cassette recorder, that's a laser disc of some kind, maybe a CD actually, CD player, word processor, calculator, these are various types of cassettes, video cassettes and audio cassettes, all of these devices can now be seen in one device, look at this, emailers, digital cameras, of various kinds, music players, handheld gaming devices, text messaging devices, alarm clocks, digital cameras, personal still, like iPod for example, that's a diamond Rio actually, T 
games, video cameras, handheld gaming machines, all this kind of stuff, all being shrunk down into one device. This is technological convergence. Smartphones, tablets, phablets, which is like a uh, an iPhone Plus. It's a uh, halfway between a tablet and a phone. They're all examples of technological convergence. So are games consoles they don't just play video games anymore they allow us to stream video off netflix they allow us to play cds they allow us to get on to they play blu-rays they allow us to get onto, you know uh, spotify or whatever they're a one box multimedia entertainment hub now the fact that we're using these to consume media via the internet, not something simple like a television where the government could control what's broadcast to us, and because the internet is global, it makes the enforcement of government laws and regulation very difficult. Think of the use of proxy servers and virtual private networks, for example. The American version of Netflix, due to international distribution laws, has got a vastly superior catalogue of films than the British one. But by simply using a virtual private network to fake an American IP address, you can fool Netflix into thinking you're in America and therefore getting the full American content rather than the British one using proxy servers enables you to bypass firewalls look at the great chinese firewall in china they've got much more restrictive internet laws in this country but they very heavily censor their internet but chinese users can use proxy servers to get onto international websites that the government would otherwise block access to i mean the only way to completely control your citizens internet access is like in North Korea to not have any internet. It's the only way to do it. So that's the basics of uh, Sonny Livingston and Peter Lunt's theories. In class, we'll be doing some research into film and television and video game classification and censorship uh, as an example to illustrate this. Uh, if you need any help, you know where I am and how to contact me. This is the last of the main theories you need to know. So there'll be fewer of these flip learning videos for after watch in the future. You'll be very glad to know. Um, and after half term, in particular, we'll be starting to look at the key um, text that you need to know about. Okay, talk to you next time.